Today I'm joined by a very funny comedian. You guys just saw him kill it on the Charlie Sheen roast on Comedy Central a few weeks ago. You know him from The Office. You know him from the many comedy clubs all around the country, Mr. Patrice O'Neill. Patrice, what's up, brother? What's up, man? How you doing? Let's talk about um, just, you know, touring as a comedian. I mean, obviously you got a lot of other stuff you're doing on the side, but would you call stand-up your, your first true love? Um, yeah, yeah. A little, you know, um, I'm, 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 sounding, I'm sounding reserved because it's like I've been doing it so long, but I don't have anything else to, like, go, I love something else, I think. So I guess, yeah, but I'm, I've been in a, I guess it's, I've been in a 20-year relationship with comedy and like anything else if you've been in a 20-year relationship with anything else it gets you know you go do i do i uh do i leave do i leave or do i try to find something else do i get like it's the seven-year itch so i you know i i know it started as as love and now it's it's still love but it's just like like any other relationship is it's some business in it too and business always makes it kind of kind of strange so to, to say that I, I i'm i just i struggle with that question about you know it's my first love uh funny is always a part of my life but you know comedy is it's such a different thing from just being a funny person that you know it, it's difficult uh, but to be honest um i'm appreciative and i'm and i'm i'm still happy you know what i mean I'm appreciative and still happy to, to, to answer the question. Uh, you know, I don't know. That's a weird. You asked me a question to make me think about. It, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, 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 you know, I mean, yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, how long you been writing, or how long you been doing what you doing? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a few years I've been writing. I mean, I would say I've been writing my whole life, but, you know, only started to do it professionally within the past few years. I've actually done a little bit of stand-up comedy myself and, you know, definitely not nowhere near as much as you have. And, you know, I found myself getting turned off a little bit by the ins and outs of the industry and kind of the scene. And it's kind of draining, you know. You you think that it's funny people, you know, be, being funny all the time, but there's, you know, there's some, you know, depressed people involved in comedy. I mean, it sounds like you kind of have a love-hate relationship with it just judging by your tone. Does that, I mean, correct me if if I'm wrong. Um, well, yeah, the business because of what you just said, it's it's the business, the business part of it, the people part. Like, look, they always like people who want to do documentaries and stuff. They always want to do something and make comics. They always go, oh wow, it's gonna be great because comics are involved. I remember a show I did that was introduced to me about. I, I think ABC was gonna do it, but they're not gonna do it no more, I guess. But it was like comedians ride together two comedians ride together across country in a car and it was a race so it was like 20 comics or something and they all rode together in a in a, in a race to see who you know to see you know to, to you know they, they just thought it would be hilarity but i was just like do they even realize how miserable comedians are like yeah. funny. <laughs> like this 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 the comedy thing is really like you said it's really miserable but I don't know. I'm not. I ain't going nowhere. I got nothing to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. I got nothing to, to to do. But it's just after you realize so many things, you know. If I'm thinking, would I have gotten into it if I thought it was it was it was uh, different from just being funny? Uh, maybe maybe not. You know, I don't know because I mean, funny was always a big part of my life. I, I you know, I love not. Not as much as like I go making people laugh, but I always I always just love to have people vibing with me and have some synergy and and we laugh. I've all, I always loved everyone laughing, so I still have that. That's why I love like my fans, like you know my fans that know me and get me and they get everything that I do. They know they that appreciate my funniness, and then I don't appreciate as much. The people who only, you know, could see me because I'm like, they think I'm a comedian. Like, they go, okay, be funny, make me laugh, as opposed to we're, we're making each other laugh. This is a us thing. So that's why, you know, I don't have as many fans as people think I should, but I think the fans I have, I, I, I love them. You know, I love, I love the fans that are, are there and been there and, 
and I do appreciate that because it makes me feel like we we're having a good time. Um, but there's a lot of fans that are that are just takers. They'll they'll suck you dry and then they'll move on to the next whatever the thing is. You know what? I think a true fan, you touch them. You know, and I I, I like to touch. <laughs> I like to touch people. But, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you know, I like to I like to, I like to make a difference. Either whether you hate me or love me, you know, to stir up some emotion, to stir up some some relevance in, in your heart, your mind. You know, I, I enjoy that part of it. You know, and and uh, I, I I still do enjoy that. But the chasing the dream, I should I should clarify what made me think about that question, the love of it, chasing chasing the thing that's that's chasing anything past being funny and being communi- communicative with, with people and making people feel good, that's the thing I have trouble with, chasing that thing. And, and the frustrating part is when you've invested so much time in, 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 in doing that, you you go, wow, I have to keep going. It's not even chasing a dream no more. It's it's just I got to keep going. It's like like a vampire. I, I, I might feel bad, you know, sucking blood and taking people's life it's just like taking people's money but 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 now i have to do it or i, I guess i'll die you know what i mean you, you do it for life force now as opposed to fun and giggles you do it like because you got to live but i never want to make people feel no matter what that they're coming to see a guy that's just making money so i have an ethic when it comes to performing and coming to, to try to do a good job, I can, I never, like, there's a running joke with a, with, with a buddy of mine, another comic, and I always go, I think I'm going to just do 45 tonight, and he just starts laughing at me, because I'll end up doing an hour or an hour and a half or whatever, because I, I never want the people to leave feeling like, like they didn't get a good show, you know, I, it, so, so it's, it's, I do have that love for it. But I think just chasing money and chasing glory, chasing that name, because you need money and glory to like make it all worthwhile. And then you gotta you gotta eat, and that's just not really the only way I, I make a living. You know, I mean, and I I can't complain about the living I make, but it's not enough to retire. I tell you that much. You know. Yeah. How often? How often are you redoing your set? Or I mean, and how much of your set is sort of on the spot, and how much of it is kind of something you're taking on the road and perfecting from night to night? Well, like I did the elephant in the room, and I put to bed all that material. So then, you know, I go on the road, and I and I like like I think like the way I do it is I have my stuff that I know works, and as I'm doing those things. Let's say in 2011, I'm doing all new stuff. I know what kills. And then, like, in the middle of 2011, I'll start working on some new stuff to be the the, the, the meat of 2012. So at the end of 2010, when I did did the elephant in the room, I, when I filmed that, all that material is put to bed. So now I go back on the road and try to, um, like, really perfect the stuff that I was – sort of doing in 2010 with the with the mainstay stuff of 2000 of the elephant in the room so now all that stuff is gone i have my main stuff that i'm doing now and i'm trying to write uh around the main stuff that i'm doing uh now so so to be able to like go off the cuff you gotta definitely you, you have to have a synergy with the crowd and they gotta love you but then at the same time you have the the um, structure of your of your act that helps that helps people, uh, you know, that helps you go off to the to the left. Like so, it it's like having a a, a, a navigation, a GPS, and it's a it's it's a place where you generally know where you're going, and you take a left or a right. You don't have to be that worried getting back on the road. But if you don't know where you're going, you you know, you got to rely on the GPS, meaning you got to rely on just going off the cuff or just being funny. You can end up in a bad place if you got nowhere else to go because you can take a wrong turn and you got to be able to have your professionalism and your and your preparedness and 
material to to get you back on the road. You know what I mean? So I love doing crowd work, but I like doing crowd work, you know, because I think people are interested. I, I've gotten a lot of material from from audiences, meaning I've gotten I've gotten like a, a response that I didn't think I was gonna get, and you and you really embrace that response. Like you you don't go in into it with the selfishness of of already having a bit that you worked on. You're just like, if you ask somebody where they're from, you should really want to know where they're from. So, you know, you never know what they're going to say. They might say, pogo, pogo. You go, well, holy shit. <laughs> so that's that's a whole conversation about pogo, pogo, man. And you, you can go there or you can go somewhere else, man, because people, you know, people, it's us. We're, we're you know, we're, it's an us thing. That's what this comedy is. It's an us thing. And I think the frustrating part is sometimes you you you, you feel like it's just a you and a them. And you don't want to feel like that. You know what I mean? But, but most of the time, depending on where I am, you know, if I'm in if I'm in Minnesota, you kind of feel like it's a it's a me and a you, you know. But when I'm on the East Coast, up and down the East Coast and, and up and down the West Coast, you feel like it's a me in a, a you know some cities you go to you feel like it it's your town and they and they're your people and you know you know you love them they love you you know what what was every com- it seems like every comedian sort of has their club or at least a couple clubs that they came up in and that's really where they broke in and that's where they got all their early reps and it sort of defines them as a comedian a lot of you know I know Joe Rogan always talking about the comedy store in LA and you know is there is there a specific club that you pinpoint and you're like all right that's what made Patrice O'Neill Lisa's an early comedian probably. I mean, I started in Boston, but I made my bones, I think. I, I got my, you know, I, I grew up and got and got um, older in the Boston Comedy Club in New York, probably. You know, that was like, you know, you sit there and you, you're able to really work out what's on your mind without, without you know, endangering your career. You know, they give you. They gave me more time. They gave me more space. They gave me more. Uh, uh, you know, I was able to kind of flourish for a little while in in uh, in the Boston Comedy Club. I think I would say that. Yeah, Boston Comedy Club. Cool. All right, let, let's let's all right, let's switch gears a little bit. Now, something that uh, happened recently that I wouldn't say really made headlines, but was your appearance on the Charlie Sheen roast on Comedy Central. And you know, when I found out I was going to get to talk to you, I, I was actually kind of glad because it was something that I was thinking about since then. I know that I got into a lot of arguments with some friends at work and stuff like that about how serious you were actually being when you sort of kind of it seemed like you dropped your act a little bit and sort of then were you know calling out William Shatner for being, being a racist and stuff like that. Was that really like a, an actual? Change change in mood there or was that something you would plan to do and just talk about that moment because i mean for me it well, was, had it, all my friends was, talking I, I never did i never did these things before uh, the, the, the problem I, I had for for a long time with these roasts was that you watch the dean martin roast if you watch those and those really you know make you feel good it was because of the camaraderie you know so one thing when i went in i just felt there was no camaraderie there was no real love. And when I went on, you know, I had my prepared stuff and whatever, but I'm, again, I'm a, I, I, I'm organic. Um, I have a degree of, of organic, uh, you know, synergy, you know, with people. And so I'm sitting there, I knew I was going to last. So all I was doing was <clears throat> trying to assess how, to make this an, uh, feel like an uh, authentic, actual moment um, that people felt was was um, real, as a you know. So I think I learned this a long time ago, years ago, uh, from this comic named Steve Cato. Uh, probably, I don't know if you heard of him, but years ago I learned that you know people will <clears throat> people will let you lie. They'll let you just do what you do and, and no one's going to really be upset about it. But if you have an opportunity, you should, um, you, 
if you have an opportunity, you should you should uh, acknowledge the the truth of what's going on. So, um, no, I wasn't upset. Like, not even a little bit. I, I just was acknowledging. You know, I was acknowledging uh, the situation, which was William Shatner somehow was a racist at the moment. But it, I, I, I really didn't. No, I didn't. It did not a thing bother me. I come from a rough, um, a rough crew. You know, we were we we're rough with each other with honesty and love. We we roasted each other every night. You know, the guys that I that I would roll with. You know, we. We roll, you know, you know, Geraldo, and he used to roll. We would we roll with us, you know, me and Colin Quinn and Nick DiPaolo and Keith Robinson and and, and Robert Kelly and Jim Norton, um, you know, and all the guys that used to hang out at the Comedy Cellar at night. We 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 were mean to each other, but it was all kind of love, mean. So. You, you know, no nobody could nobody who sits and prepares and writes jokes for uh, for a month can hurt my feelings. They can, I mean, there's nothing really to say. I mean, they they can, you know, they they can basically they're just they're just writing what they Google or what what's on Wikipedia and they just say their jokes and no, it's just there's no hurt. <clears throat> I actually appreciated William Shatner because he gave me a a beginning to, I mean, it was, it was heavily edited. Don't forget that too. Oh yeah. But he gave, he gave me a, uh, a beginning. He gave me somewhere to go. Like sometimes when you do a comedy show, you, you need a, a place to start. Like, you know, you don't want to just start by saying, knock, knock, who's there to the audience. You just, you kind of need a place to go. Hey guys, what's happening? You know, what's, what's on my mind? What's the feel, you know? And he gave me a place to, to go because I, I thought, you know, I love Jeff Ross, but um, William Shatner's style lent itself greatly to what I wanted to do, which was to to have an organic feel, like like what I was saying earlier about going off script. I had the jokes prepared, you know, so it but it lent me it lent me the the base to be able to just to to, to say something different other than my prepared jokes. I, I, I was there to be funny and, 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 you know, I'm not at my best um, reciting a joke, you know what I mean? And, and I'm not saying this with any uh, detriment or any, you know, I'm not begrudging anybody's style. That's, this is, you know, what we do is like the circus, you know, it's like, you know, the trapeze guy, the lion tamer, everybody got a different flow, but we all in the circus. So, I, I'm saying my style is, is. I was happy to be able to make you and your friend argue. That's my style. That's my style is to to make to say something, not just to be irreverent or or or, or douche to to just to say, hey, I want some people to love me and then some people to hate me because that's natural. So if you arguing with your friends about was I upset or real, that's what I needed to do. But don't you know? Don't forget if you at the circus and the, and the, the the trapeze guy flips and falls, he wasn't trying to flip and fall. He was trying to flip and make you go wow. So if I flipped and fought, fell, then you you got you can't forget that I was trying to do. <laughs> I was trying to make you laugh. I was trying to really make you have some fun and make you, you know, feel good. And, and, and sometimes to feel good, others got to feel bad if you're being honest. Some, you know, the way you were, most people are funny is that it was at the expense of someone else. And not, not just pointing at them, but it's, it's, at, it's at the expense of their beliefs, at the expense of their attitude, at the expense of their, their opinion. And if someone else is on your side, so some some so a lot of humor is at at the expense of someone else's uh, safety net. So I do appreciate when somebody you know goes, oh he's an asshole. When I'm trying to just be a funny dude. So you know when I when I did that, it was a lot of off the cuff. It was a lot of it. Put it this way, 
it was prepared at and at, it, I had a prepared place, but I my what I've been practicing my whole life is to be able to be okay in the moment of possible failure. And, you know, I I feel like I feel like my my years of preparing for moments like the roast I I came through for myself, you know what I mean? So, you know, to answer your question, uh, you know, I guess clearly is that yeah, yeah, it was off the cuff because it was it, you know, I mean, they had a they had a teleprompter and they had people there who were super pissed at me for doing that, for going off script because they, you know, it was people that, you know, the teleprompter guy was probably getting yelled at, at by the producer and the producer might have been getting yelled at, at by one of the executives. That, who, who the fuck knows what happened um, in the background because everybody there is uh, ready, they're prepared. So I come in as a loose cannon and I really wasn't a loose cannon. I just was a guy that was, I was loose, so they, they'll add cannon at the end, but it worked out, you know what I mean? It, it worked out, and it worked out for the better. It worked out in a way where they understood that you, you know, I was trying to bring some camaraderie to it. I was trying to, my anger was trying to bring some camaraderie to it, some real, some reality to it, you know, not just frivolous words of, hey, this fat guy got diabetes. Makes no sense to me. Yeah. I, had, I didn't even have jokes prepared for a lot of the people. You know, I, I, I really, see, I, I appreciated it because I was watching that roast and I mean, sort of like what you were saying before about comedy, you know, being all about making people laugh and then it becomes more about a business. I mean, those first couple roasts, like I remember there was a shack roast, like, I don't know, maybe like eight years ago now that was fantastic. And it sort of, you felt like you said the camaraderie between Jamie Foxx and Shaq and like everyone wanted to be there. But I feel like Comedy Central sort of turned that into a business model. And now we're recreating these things. We're roasting people like Charlie Sheen, who let's be honest, really just wanted to be on TV and have everyone, everyone worship him for a couple more hours. So I'm watching this thing that felt like this robotic drone of people like Jeff Ross, who are legitimately funny, going out there and kind of, you know, just, you know, throwing rocks at a wall at Mike Tyson and, and Charlie Sheen, these celebrities who really you can't make fun of because they've become a caricature of themselves. And then it felt, it felt like you were watching it with the same eyes I was, thinking, what the fuck is this? This isn't a rose. And then you come up there and, you know, whether you, you, you kind of like, you know, had in the back of your mind that you were going to do it or not I, I could see in your eyes that you were kind of caught off guard by what you were witnessing and I was as well so I feel like you, you definitely brought the you know what I think a lot of viewers were thinking watching that rose because it just didn't it didn't feel it didn't feel right well you, you you're talking for somebody who you know has a utopian uh view of the rose which is they're supposed to be super just a bunch of people you know that love each other and they're teasing each other and it's and it's it's just a good time and it's wink wink it's it's like people are watching um people are watching like some inside stuff that they go wow these guys man I would love to hang out with these guys that that feeling has gone I I actually did, did the roast because I I respected Charlie for his what he did when he went against the machine, you know, I, I, I liked that he, he just, I know people think it was, you know, the whole tiger blood and, and winning, it was kind of um, eccentric, but um, I just love that he, that he made somebody's stomach turn, who's a part of the, just a part of the, the machine that doesn't really care, just, it's a, it's a money making monster that just, that if you're not making money, it ain't an art monster. It's not a monster that eats art. It's a monster that eats money, and it, it has to survive. And and for a guy that was making two million dollars a, a week, um, to to just lose it enough to say fuck it because it's such a wild business. Um, and I think he's come back to his senses where he's like, holy shit, I was making two million dollars a week. What am I doing? And I think he's coming back down from from that to be a little more like, you know, um, agreeable. But at that moment when he was doing it, I, I actually was, I was actually really, I, I was into watching not a person implode or, 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 you know, fall off the deep end. 
just a person that could wrinkle, you know, or ruffle some feathers, man. And, and, and you know, it was, I, that's why I did it. I, I, I appreciated what he did. Um, and that's why I said yes. But what, sitting there watching it, you go, you, you just go, eh, you know, hey, you know, I did it. You know, Comedy Central was happy. And they asked, you know, would you do another one? And, and I really, I mean, this is why I'm such an idiot. You know, you go, you know, you say to yourself, would I do it again? My, my, my The first thing I should say is, of course, yes. Ten million people watch this fucking thing. I don't have it. I ain't thinking twice about doing it again. Hell yeah. Tomorrow. Or I'm thinking, I did what I did. I'm not going to be able to follow myself because it was a moment that was captured. So now it's like, well, Patrice, re- recreate that moment. Go up last and have Patrice do his thing, Majiggy. And if I did it, I probably, you know, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd be on and buy a couple of houses. And, but at the same time, I, you know, my fuel is not money. Money is how I how I eat and survive and try to make people around me comfortable. I would love to make that kind of money to give away. I want, I want to make give away money so that everybody else around me can, can be very happy to have that ability to be happy. My mother will never have the, 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 the happiness that I know that, that she can really get to experience that kind of happiness without me. Cause my mother's a, a lifer, a job lifer. And, and my girl she works hard, and I and I hope she makes her own way. But you know, I I think that I'm I'm the key to a lot of people's uh, money happiness, and I'm trying to find a balance of being able to do that without killing myself, and where they can have some fun too. You know, I sent my mother home. I was at at Foxwoods Casino. And, um, you know, I, I, I sent my mother home in a, in a, you know, in one of the little, uh, Lincoln town cars. So it was about a three hour ride. She was going to take the bus up to see me perform. She took it up, but on the way back, you know, I stuck her in a, a little, a little, you know, car service, which she hasn't experienced because she doesn't, she hasn't got her mind to be that kind of comfortable and, I, I wanted to just make her comfortable. And that, that would, it, it's not, it wasn't a lot. And to some other people, you know, they buy their mother a, a car service with a, with a limo driver that's on call 24 hours. I would love to do that, to give her that, that ability to, 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 to do that. But I can't risk what I know, how I know my fuel is. I, I, I really need the fuel and I, I can't, I can't, money is not my, my, my complete motivation, but if I can find something that coincides with how I feel as a person and what, what keeps me going and, and, and some money, if I can figure that out, I think, I think the roast was, was a, was a step. It, it was a, it was a step for people that didn't see me ever to get to see me, um, do what I do. Like, okay, who's this big black dude who's going last on the roast? That's Lisa Lampanelli's spot. Where's Wendy Cummins? Where's Lisa? Where's, you know, we know Greg passed, but if Greg was still alive, where's Greg? What the hell's going on here? And I'm going last, and I'm the only black guy in there, so it was like, well, what's going on? So for me to be able to pull it off and people at least, whether they liked it or, or hated it, they saw that, you know, what what I would bring to something um, else, you know, what my ability is, you know, what my ability is, is to assess the situation and, and say, say generally what I think to be, um, hopefully as honest as of an approach as I can have about something. And, uh, you know, hopefully that, that open up the door that, 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 that that's possible and open up the door that somebody black can do it. You know what I mean? Cause usually they'll go, I right, well, let's get somebody white in to do this this style because we don't want to deal with these crazy niggas, man. That's show business. <laughs> well, you know, it is what it is. I mean, I think that that mentality of yours is also what makes you great on the radio. I mean, you obviously do O and A a lot. 
Um, I actually, I have this vivid memory once of driving home from work, like so early that O and A was on in the morning, and I'm driving home on the Merritt Parkway, hearing you go on a rant about the Merritt Parkway and about driving on how it's just a dark two lane highway in the middle of the night, and a deer will jump out of you, whatever. I have a vivid memory of that, and uh, I mean, just just talk about doing O and A and like what that does for you as a comic to just keep your brain going and doing such conversational stuff. Which I mean, like you said, I mean that's when you come up with some of your stuff is just sitting around talking to other funny people. People. And I feel like that to me is more of the quote unquote old roast type of, uh, you know, uh, environment that we used to love that sort of has faded away. You still get when you're on the radio with those guys. So talk about O&A a little bit. Yeah, they, they, um, you don't, some, you, I don't, you know, sometimes you don't realize or you forget what someone does in terms of, um, of, uh, what's, what's the word mentoring you, you know, preparing you a, you know, to, you know, getting you prepared and mentoring you in terms of, 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 um, you, you, you take for granted sometimes that, you know, you, cause you're sitting there with guys that you develop a relationship with and there's millions of people listening and you don't even think about it like that. You just think about it in, in, in terms of, um, just hanging with some dudes that make you laugh and you, 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 it's an us thing. Like, like o, o and A is like, you know, cause Norton and, and, and Anthony and, 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 and Opie, it's like you go on there and you're not, you know, you got to plug a show. I get out there and oh, I'm going to plug a show, but you forget, you know, you forget to plug a show cause you're just having fun and you're talking and you, and you, you just, and, and you get spoiled because it's, it's pretty much uncensored. You know, you can say anything you want. I mean, they're, they're, if you, you you say the wrong thing, and that comes with seasoning. You say the wrong thing, you you can get into a bit of a problem. You know, I mean, it's not like it's you know, it's not like they 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 have a um, they're autonomous from you know being responsible for what you say. But it's just still just very dude hanging out kind of thing that somehow has been seen as bad now for some reason, like, you know, to hang out, to hang and do the dudes doing dude stuff. And when I say dude stuff, you know, you know, women and, and all these goofy people that don't even understand what, what dude stuff is, have an opinion about it. And, and instead of knowing that this, that's a, that's a whole nother paradigm that should exist they try to destroy it so that they can feel comfortable because they know do stuff really is anti sissy stuff. Like, you know, just everybody, when I say sissy, I mean, girls, I mean, uh, uh, guys who are liars who try to just fit in with the, with the everyday nonsense that they, they do what they're told to do. Just the basic sheep attitude of, I want to get along with everybody and I, I, you know, I don't want to get in trouble. So they listen to me. That's why I think I get mad at people because they're not willing to take a stand for you. Like they, they listen in the dark. So you say something that you feel they'll leave you twisting in the wind because they listen to you and you say what they want to say. But when it, when the shit is the fan. They act like they would never, they they would never want to hear what you had to say. How dare you? What is going on? But really, they in the background going, yeah, please say what I feel. Say, do this for me. So it's almost like, I guess you really sometimes want the sheep to go, hey, thanks. You know what I mean? You know, thanks. You know, hey, look, or, or just be honest. Hey, look, man, I can't publicly be on your side, but God damn it. I love what you say. And that's what O and A brings. It, it you know, Anthony has the he has the voice of the racists and Opie has the voice of the of the the, the kind of hipsters and and Norton has the voice of, of you know, three or four different segments of, of the you know, the the, the the meatheads. They love Norton, you know, the, the he's he's like the king of the as they call tin knockers, you know, it's like and then I come in and I'm I'm on black people's side, but I'm on white people's side. I'm the fair guy, you know what I mean? And 
you know, Bobby has his place, and and you just go up there and you um, what's the word? You you um, develop into a person you don't even know that you're developing into uh, because you get to have this this um, this platform, and 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 I guess O and A gave me you know a platform as as did Tough Crowd. See, Tough Crowd and 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 uh, O and A. Have, have are a few things that's given me the thing that makes me want to that made me want to do comedy is the idea of being with people that you really like, um, and you talk and you're together, but you just you're together on a on a medium on a, on TV or on radio, and you you just you don't when when it's like that you don't think that it's elevating you as a person you just think that's what it is but. You forget that it's the business, and you forget that it is radio, and you forget that it is TV when you're with people you like. Like, that's one thing. When I'm around people that I don't like and I don't have camaraderie with, and this is why I'm trying very hard to be the boss of my own universe, because then I can bring in all the people that I like. Uh, without being a boss, you have to be around the people that other people like, but they might not like you, so you're not really a part of that group. And I, I don't stay. I leave when I don't have my own, when I don't have synergy. I don't I don't stay. And, I, I mean, I've been around O&A, got to be since 2002, 2003. That's eight years, nine years. And and that nine years went by like, 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 boom. I was on Tough Crowd for two years. It didn't seem, it was no pressure. I could be doing Tough Crowd right now with no problem because I wouldn't be thinking, oh, it's, it's, a, it's the eighth year, it's the seventh year, it's the tenth year of Tough Crowd because I liked everybody that I did Tough Crowd with. I, you know, every day you go in and you talk shit to dudes you like. And if somebody else came along and and they came in, you get to see, you get to meet people that they ain't having it. And then you get to meet people that's, that just comics, really funny people love Tough Crowd. Comics who aren't funny, and they never were funny, hated Tough Crowd. It pulled a lot of people's skirts up. And I think ONA does the same thing when they come in that room. They know it's love. You know, like, Louis Black, man, you know, who was just on ONA the other day. It was like, it's love, man. You just you just see Louis Black sitting there, and you, you love the guy. You know, you know he's a soldier. You know he's been down a long time in the business. And um, so you're just happy to be in the same place with Louis Black. And you want to make him as comfortable as possible so that he can be as good as he can be so I can laugh with him and he can laugh with me. And we it's a we thing that a lot of people don't know. I Like, I never understood people that could do radio alone. I think that is one of the most, like, in terms of scary people <laughs> that can do a radio show by themselves is, I don't know what to call it, megalomaniac, serial killer? <laughs> I don't know. It's shocking to me. I, I want to be, you know, with with people I like, man. I'm a social dude. Like, I'm getting more and more recognized and more and more scrutinized. And that's that's a hell of a thing because I'm a, I'm a man of the, of the people, man. I'm a man of the streets. I shop at Marshall's. So, you know, if I ever get famous enough, I can't, I can't shop in Marshalls because that's not where I'm supposed to shop. I I hate that feeling. I hate the feeling that I got to I gotta be protective of myself. So that's a part of the game. But I'm not in it for that. I'm in it for the synergy of, of people, of making somebody laugh. I'm not in it so I can shop at the most exclusive sneaker store. You know what I'm saying? I, I, or... I like being amongst the people because I like to tell the people what they're doing wrong, too, as opposed to the people telling me what what they don't like or dislike. I want to be in your face like, well, what about you, lousy motherfucker? You know, but you got to you get to a certain point. You got to you got to stay hidden, I guess. You know what I mean? I, I like I like being I like being um rational. This thing turns you irrational and paranoid and. It, it, it's a hell of a thing, man. But at the same time, the only thing that makes you better than being a plumber is the money. That's it. The <laughs> only thing that makes it better is being is, is you know somebody will pay for things for you. 
somebody give you a gift, you know, uh, you know, Comedy Central gave me an iPad too, you know, for for my trouble. You know, I got an iPad too because they appreciated me on the roast. You know what I mean? I appreciated my iPad too. <laughs> now there's somebody that I look at. I, I got an iPad one already, but I got one iPad too. Bam! <laughs> and that is trapping. Those are trappings that make it, I guess, better than you know. Uh, Standing on scaffolding or something, man. It 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 it, it is. It, it does uh, give you something. It, you you experience certain things that you wouldn't be able to experience if you if you were just you know doing a nine to five, man. It's a lot of trappings, you know, front row seats at the at the ball game, depending on how how famous you are. You know, hello, Mr. O'Neill. Hello, Mr. O'Neill. Hello, Mr. O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill. Mr. O'Neill. Of course, Mr. O'Neill. You know, you get used to that. You you want that. It, it, it's 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 definitely a trapping. You know what I mean? And I I mean, I do like it, but I I do want to find a a a more like glorious spiritual place. Um, and I don't I don't mean that you know, re- religiously, but I just mean that in terms of your your own spirit, just how to take this and enjoy what you do and enjoy the things that it, that comes with it, but also remain a, uh, a relevant figure, someone that's not going to b- betray humanity. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, I don't, I don't want my life to end up being like, I own a cigarette company. I'm making zillions of dollars, but I gotta sell poison. I don't want to sell poison. You know what I mean? I, I I try to I try to be as honest as possible, but I mean, look, man, I got some lies and some fucking. I got I definitely got some secrets that I'm trying to hide. You know what I'm saying? And somebody will find them motherfuckers out, and I gotta deal with it. And they'll call me a hypocrite, but you know, there's there's a there's a percentage to everything. And you can be a hundred percent hypocrite, you can be a fifty percent one, or you can be a a ten percent hypocrite. You know, it's, it's it's you know nothing nothing is uh is absolute or or complete. So I'm I'm just trying to be uh, a decent human being, a decent one, because this business, the less decent you are, the more successful you are. You know, and and. You know, it really is a waste of time being a decent person in this game, but I got no other no I got nothing else. You know what I mean? So I'm 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 hoping I figure it all out and and be able to make people within my a uh, a uh, ten foot uh vicinity of, of me uh happy and then and myself. You know what I mean? A, a circle of people that really I can I can thank them and they can thank me and we can just feel good with each with each other, I, I really, you know, I really hope that I can find some people that that I I love as much as I love my dogs. Um, you know, the purity of it, the purity between, you know, me and my dogs. You know, they they give you what they what you need, and you give them what they need, and and that's those are the human relationships. I'm trying to find human beings that we can, we we love each other like you love your dogs you know what i'm saying i do know what you're saying patrice all right brother thank you so much for the time once again mr patrice o'neill check him out online find out when he's coming to your city hysterical thank you for the time boss